so people are eating all the time. Eating itself uh, drives inflammation. Inflammation is our normal response to food being in our in our gut. So anytime, anytime I eat something, the body normally gets a little inflamed just as a protection of that foreign protein, that foreign material coming into the body. So if you think about it, if you want to improve your diet and you don't want to change what you're eating, you can still improve your health, improve your diet by just not eating all the time. In other words, uh, narrow your eating window, cut out between meal snacks, maybe even skip breakfast, maybe even skip lunch. I mean, I eat one meal a day and I've never felt better. I don't get brain fog in the middle of the day and I'm in something called ketosis nearly all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that's the, for me, it's the healthy way to be and I love it. So, you know, I started a keto diet years ago. I kind of, you know, I kind of go on and off of it, right? But just simply as a weight loss thing. And it actually worked incredibly well, it works incredibly well when you're in that state of ketosis, right? The fat is being uh, burned instead of carbohydrates. There's not, there's, there aren't carbohydrates to burn, I guess. And ketosis, I mean, if you think about it, human beings evolved over hundreds of thousands of years as primarily hunter-gatherers. And uh, at that point, if you're a hunter-gatherer, you're, you eat when you, you have a kill, and then you may go for a period of a, a week or so with fasting, at which point you're in ketosis. And it wasn't until what, 12,000 years ago with the agricultural revolution, which uh, Jared Diamond, who wrote Guns, Germs, and Steel, and, and even Nuval Harari, who wrote Sapiens, both of them famously agree that the worst possible thing that the human beings have done was with the development of agriculture. And, and you can see why, because agriculture made food available nearly constantly. And that was accelerated, of course, with refrigeration and junk foods. But, but as food became more and more available, people did not go into ketosis because there wasn't this period of fasting between the hunt and the, and the kill. And the amazing thing about ketosis is, as I researched it more, it doesn't just help diabetes but ketosis helps uh, cancer. It's a, it's a cancer tr a treatment or an adjunct to chemotherapy for patients. In Alzheimer's disease patients, ketosis is, for many of them, uh, helps bring back their memory. So one could argue that ketosis is the, the natural healthy state of human beings throughout history until literally the last 12,000 years. And some of the most amazing things about ketosis are in neurodegenerative diseases. You know, we, t we talked a little bit off camera about Guillain-Barre syndrome and, and it's seen with Parkinson's disease and certainly with, with seizures, ketosis is fasting, which drives ketosis, is an accepted treatment for seizures 2,000 years ago. There's a whole work about how junk food drives violence in, in kids. Some, these are correlation studies, right. not, not controlled prospective studies. So sure. causality can't be inferred, inferred, but there's certainly some correlations with uh, people eating junk food and being more angry, being more depressed, uh, being more anxious. So it's, it's, it's really exciting, some of the possibilities that are out there now. Well, you know, the, the, there's a couple of things that come to mind. The, the, the first one I wanted to mention, you mentioned the agrarian revolution. A couple of, uh, uh, a, a couple of people agree that it's kind of, you said, the worst thing that happened to humanity. Well, it also argue, arguably, you know, civilization comes from it. So it wasn't like all bad, right? <laughs> right, but, it's, but in ter you're saying in terms of the body. Well, right? in, in, in terms, terms of, of the body, and, right. I, and I certainly, when I heard that, I, I thought, well, this can't be true. Civilization, you know, it allowed people to have philosopher classes, working classes, you know, different classes of, of people with spare time when the food was saved. But, but interestingly, there's, you know, there's now evidence that there were some relatively advanced civilizations much earlier than we thought, Absolutely. like Gepekli Tepe in Turkey and a similar, another site near Egypt, that yeah. in Egypt mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So, so um, the, before the agricultural revolution, it's, there, it may not be that we were all walking around in caves, you know, hunter-gatherers, hunter but, but you're right, it is a balance. There, there were benefits of agriculture. Right. Well, well you know, the, and the thing is that, that it, it doesn't have to be one, it doesn't have to be one or the other either. 
you know, in, in a way we've been conditioned to believe that a pill or some kind of medical intervention is what's going to solve our problem. Like we've kind of given away our you know, have responsibility for our health to the doctors. And that is also translated into the use of all sorts of medications, which, many of which also interact with each other in negative ways. And people, you know, I've heard incredibly bizarre statistics about how many medications some people take. And you just think to yourself, my God, they, 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 they all have side effects. Yep. Right. And, and, you know, the more you take, the more likely one of those things will come up and some of them are hidden. Some of them will come later. You know, we're just we're just like a highly medicalized society. I, and I, it's a great point. I think part of it, too, as we talked about, if I go to a doctor, I'd much rather have a pill than get a lecture about I need to exercise more and, you know, change my diet because I I used to believe that lifestyle didn't really matter and what really worked was a pill and furthermore i used to believe and many people still believe that taking the pill will actually not just treat the symptoms of their disease but will actually control the disease and make them healthier and that's really not not true in in many if not most cases for example in diabetes type 2 diabetes giving the patient insulin and metformin to control the blood sugar spikes doesn't really control the long-term effects of the disease. You still continue to progress on your diabetes. You get your foot amputated. You get your renal failure. You get your blindness. You get your heart attack. You get your Alzheimer's. So I think people aren't aware that in many cases, these pills don't really solve the problem. They just treat the symptoms. And the interesting thing is there's no pill for metabolic disease. There's no pill that you can take that will uh, reverse these things. Metabolic disease is driven by lifestyle, and lifestyle is really the, the secret to it. Well, and the, and the corollary, as we're, we've kind of been touching on, right, is that you have to be responsible. No one's going to do it for you, right? Like whether it's Congress versus agencies. I mean, these bureaucracies develop in ways to kind of avoid create, avoid a locus of responsibility <laughs> at any cost, right? I mean, and 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 just it's like almost like a theme in our society, where I, I want some kind of external factor to fix things. Exactly. I, I love this about your show: uh, questioning the narratives, asking the big questions about science and other things in our society, and. And to your point, we need to take responsibility. A lot of medicine over the last, you know, the 20th century it developed a very paternalistic attitude. You know, you let the doctor take care of everything. They're going to take care of anything. And, and you, you, you turn over all responsibility to the doctor. And the problem with that is, as we've seen, the, the doctor doesn't control your lifestyle. I control my lifestyle. We all control our lifestyle. So, we need to learn that, that we're in charge of our health, not the doctor. If I recall correctly, like half of what uh, professors in medical school teach their students is wrong, <laughs> at least, right? I think that's your assertion. That, that's very disturbing news. <laughs> One of the greatest physicians of all time, uh, Sir William Osler, uh, famously made one of the greatest comments about medical education when he addressed a group of medical students on the day of their graduation uh, to being becoming physicians. He said, gentlemen, and at the time most, most medical students were, were male, if not gentlemen at least, he said, gentlemen, I have a confession to make. Half of what we've just taught you is wrong. The problem is, we don't know which half. <laughs> People who understand medical education or even science itself will know this is a process of science. It's all about questioning the existing narrative and, and throwing out the stuff that's incorrect and learning the new stuff. But, but uh, Sir William Osler pointed it out beautifully and that's the theme for, for my book with the, you know, the clickbait title, Lies I Taught in Medical School. But it basically, it goes through the half of things that I taught were wrong and uh, hopefully can help people avoid the mistakes that I made and, you know, uh, nearly uh, cost me my, my health and, and my life. 
Don't forget to subscribe to our Alerts newsletter and you'll never miss an episode.